Hi everyone, today we have with us Maurizio Montalti. Ciao Maurizio. Ciao, hello everybody. The Maurizio is uh, an entrepreneur, is a designer, researcher, educator, entrepreneur, a, a lot of things in one man. I met him because he has a great experience on the field of uh, not only design, but also what we call uh, mushroom or mycelium. And uh, right now is really a hot topic that seems something new, but actually it's something super old. And Maurizio, do you want to give some introduction of yourself? Self. I started my design research uh, career quite a number uh, of years ago, more than a decade ago, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, it consists in a studio, it's a studio practice, creative practice called Officina Corpuscoli, where we mostly conduct uh, design research uh, types of projects, so different types of critical investigations that uh, particularly, but not only, though the focus is there, look at the uh, relationship between design as a discipline and other fields of expertise, uh, in particular life sciences, microbiology and fungal biology, but not only. And with a broader view, we actually very much uh, are passionate and keen on analyzing the relationship between um, the humans and uh, all the other um, life forms, all the other living and non-living agents uh, that surround us and that contribute to create actually the ecosystem we are supposed to be part of even if yet we do not uh, thoroughly recognize that belonging still working very much on that line of separation between nature and culture big long story uh, but uh, so that's what uh, uh, in a nutshell the studio does through many different projects as opposed to mogu one uh, question is, before to go to Mogu, Maurizio, sorry. When you say design, I always ask uh, myself, what, what, what do you mean with design? You design uh, a product, you design interior, you design shoes, or? Despite my background, which is rather mixed uh, and comes from product and interior and identity and so on. So there are, of course, background skills that belong to my, to my uh, expertise in some ways. Nevertheless, when I speak about design, I speak very much about uh, uh, design thinking. I think about design culture. Uh, therefore, it's really a methodological approach, the one we implement, which is very much driven by creativity and by the tools belonging to the disciplines originally, though mixed and hybridized with tools belonging to other fields. Hence, uh, and needing for us to, to actually get acquainted and, uh, and encounter and make ours, the learnings and the teachings deriving from other disciplines and enriching ourselves in this continuous, everlasting, let me say, path of learning uh, that will really never, never finish, uh, yet governed by an approach and an attitude which is the one of a designer uh, and not of uh, an entrepreneur per se. Uh, so I, again, in this way, I look at design as, a, as an agent of change uh, situated very much concerning the studio in, uh, in a realm that is the cultural one. Uh, the studio started working very much uh, uh, at its very beginnings, and still it does today, with uh, cultural institutions, with museums, with galleries, uh, with different types of audiences, also with the scientific one. And nevertheless, that was uh, the success and the limit of it. And that is the reason why, in fact, Mogu was born in the first place. You know, it's very nice to speak with, uh, with this uh, privileged audience, but that is what it is, privileged. Uh, it's probably the 0.001%, and maybe I'm even saying too much, of the global population. And when going around and speaking about change and impact, uh, while actually not being able to deliver uh, in, in a concrete way the change to reach uh, out to the global population, well, from that frustration, uh, so to call it, uh, Mogu was born with the aim of uh, uh, industrializing a range of uh, standardized processes, uh, processes that we standardized at Mogu, uh, in order to deliver um, technologies, materials, and particularly that's what we do, products. Uh, so technologies and materials that are embedded in our products uh, and that we develop for ourselves, for our own needs, of course, as nobody can provide them uh, to us really these days yet. Uh, in order to really inform and uh, possibly contributing to affect the society uh, we are part of. Uh, and particularly the relationship of human society with all the other societies, non-human ones, uh, that contribute to this great dance. 
Uh, so Mogu is in fact a, a, a company, an industrial company, an innovation driven design company, and it's based in Italy, north of Milan, uh, close to the Swiss border in the province of Varese. And that's where we have our headquarters as well as our uh, large scale production facilities these days. And you produce interior, in Mogu you produce interior uh, design. Yeah, uh, we do a lot of things. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, nevertheless, we are rather focused, but uh, ag- our focus is spread across uh, a, a bunch of different realms. Mogu is first and foremost, as I, as I mentioned, a design company. And uh, uh, we are actually uh, developing and commercializing solutions for interior. This is our commercial offering today. Uh, so in fact, if one visits our website today, we'll find mostly acoustic panels, acoustic solutions for interiors uh, uh, to actually create uh, uh, comfortable spaces in regard to sound, yeah. uh, as well as, for instance, flooring products also derived uh, from uh, uh, biofabrication and uh, uh, the employment of fungal organisms. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, of course, our main offering. And uh, uh, just a little spoiler, we are in the process of releasing our uh, 2021 catalog, which will incorporate a lot of exciting news, not only new models, but new systems, uh, little spoiler, color, uh, which is a groundbreaking uh, uh, introduction because mostly people looking at mycelium materials tend to refer to this nice off-white, uh, yellowish, creamy, brownish, yeah. orangey materials in their natural shades. And yet we are able now to deliver something that uh, is very pivotal for architecture, of course. Uh, across many other uh, innovations, let's say. But uh, again, uh, yeah, no, no, no further spoiler. Uh, okay. Please keep tuned about it. Uh, but uh, despite that, uh, we are also active in many other directions as we have a competence center internally. It's our R&D division, you could say. Um, and uh, this, uh, this competence center is actually focusing on we, what we like to define special projects, uh, one of which is uh, uh, something we have, that we have been massively investing across the past years, uh, the past three years, I would say at least uh, with a very focused uh, um, intention. Uh, and that touches upon uh, uh, another type of design, fashion design. The, in this case, in fact, we have been keenly developing uh, uh, protocols, processes, and the resulting materials that could contribute to really affect in a positive way the dreadful impact originated in the fashion industry at many levels, in this case, looking really at at the origin of the material and the way the materials are produced and eventually later on disposed of. Uh, We are participating in this race, uh, let's say, together with many other players, many, not that many. They are, you can count them on less than the hands of, uh, of on the fingers of one hand, so uh, on a global scale, which is, not so good as I would really wish to see many, many, many more actors uh, joining this uh, this gigantic challenge. Let me say. Why there are only few or Maurizio? Well, I think the reasons are multiple. Um, first and foremost, I would say the the, the fact that uh, it's not an easy job. Uh, it, we are still. We have to consider that we are still at the very beginning of uh, a biotechnological revolution when it comes to mycelium-based materials and and the benefits. Uh, that they could provide to us. Well, I'm talking here about materials and not about fungi at large, because of course there are many other benefits in other directions from food to pharmaceuticals uh, and so on and so on, Um, to computers, to technologies, chips, uh, and so on. Uh, If you want, we can briefly talk about it later on. Let's try Uh, to give a good insight on the fashion because I think otherwise we need 10 hours. (laughs) That's right, yeah, we could sit here for days speaking about these subjects. Uh, nevertheless, yeah, the, the, it's really it's a fiddly job simply because, first of all, um, let's say it's difficult to be innovative, considering that, uh, uh, again, it depends on what we consider as innovation. But we have to consider innovation within the, the cultural uh, uh, system, social system that is animating also commerce that is called capitalism and that is triggered by certain types of uh, dynamics, uh, which also include that strange thing that we call competition, which is something I I do not absolutely believe in, uh, as opposed to collaboration, which would be a much more effective way to go about things. But of course, money are driving uh, the society uh, we are living in. And uh, uh, let's say that if on a side, uh, um, it's complicated to put up uh, a pioneering uh, initiative Uh, because this is what it is. At this moment, whoever is working in this field, despite having worked in this field for some time, I can say humbly from my side, 
it's more than 10 years I do this job. Um, and there's other people that do it for, since even longer. Um, I think about colleagues in the States, um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's still a very early stage uh, set of developments. We believe all that to be rather advanced. Uh, reality is that to, so if we want to be honest to ourselves, we, we are just at the very beginning. So it's not something, a company that, uh, you know, uh, my silly, my start a company today and tomorrow I make money. It's something, oh, no. uh, it's like the wine, you know, when, when you uh, make a, a wine brand, then you start and then you put the tree and then you put the, the you need to find the land and put the tree and wait the tree that is growing. It's, it's a process of hundreds of years. Yesterday I seen in, an interview of a guy in, a guy in wine and say, yes, we survived to the most difficult uh, moment that is the first hundred years no that's uh... <laughs> that's the time frame now i hopefully it will be much shorter than that <laughs> i mean of course putting up a company with all the complexities that come along uh from from bureaucratical uh, uh type of things and to to actually the need of funding to the need of developing a suitable business plan and a competitive uh, angle that uh, could be suitable for really being able to play as, a, as, as an actor in the market, uh, to actually identify your own technologies and therefore develop them and in some ways protect them to avoid somebody stealing them from you and preventing you to do the job you actually initiated in the first place. That's very typical uh, and happening quite often also these days, something to be very, very careful about that uh, I warn all listeners about, uh, anybody that is about to start something, be very keen on the legal side. Um, but not for, for preventing others, but for protecting yourself first, because we are diving in a fantastic sea, uh, blue and crystalline waters and really exciting uh, uh, ecosystem there, but it's also full of sharks and sharks can be great uh, uh, fellows, but they can also eat you. Uh, and this is what okay, but uh, connected to this and, and also on your uh, going to your personal uh, uh, side, Maurizio, there's a one question that we always do to all our guests. What is for Maurizio sustainability? Ooh la la, that's uh, uh, an apparently simple one. And instead, it's a pretty difficult question, simply because the word sustainability for me is completely um, meaningless almost these days. Of course, we all know what we refer to as an optimum usually. When mentioning this word, there's been so much greenwashing that, of course, people out there, uh, I think everybody tends to have his own strange definition of sustainability. Some people go extreme in the positive direction, thinking about sustainability as the optimum, the processes that, consume, that are zero energy, that are carbon negative, that are uh, magical, apparently. Well, there's no such thing existing. Uh, other people consider sustainability as marketing, and that is even more uh, problematic. Uh, if I have to tell you my version uh, is a version that replaces the word sustainability with new notions that uh, uh, should become more important than all these different types of understanding that, ones, that, that individuals can have about uh, this uh, misunderstood and highly misused uh, notion. And I would translate it in resilience, um, so the capacity really to actually adapt to, to changes uh, and therefore to have products and materials uh, programmed to adapt to changes. And this also includes, of course, uh, uh, the, the effect of tackling their life cycle. You know, the phases uh, from the origin, and often we forget that, uh, to the end of life. And therefore, regeneration is another synonym for sustainability and goes hand in hand uh, with the previous one. And uh, let me add one more, the most important transparency. This is what is missing. And this is what is needed to counteract this uh, dreadful uh, set of actions that characterize today's market, uh, where everybody out there shouts out loud big uh, uh, statements that become sensational claims that are hardly questioned by the press even these days, because we live in a culture of information where everything that one says gets accepted and gets even boosted farther without even checking the source and the origin of that information. And this is so problematic because it creates this illusion, first an illusion in the, the people out there that know nothing about those things and still need to be educated about it. On the other hand, this illusion when it comes to figuring out that everything that one believed was already a fact is in fact not, it's a vision. Uh, and this is a major problem. Transparency and honesty, from brands and from major players are the most important facts and are, of course, not the most productive ones in the short term. 
because if you shout out loud uh, big claims, you attract the interest of investors and you might be able to gather some uh, important financial resources, for instance. Nevertheless, the distrust that you generate in the public can be coming against you as a boomerang. So yes. be aware. This is a great definition, Maurizio. You, you really touch with the three main words, you really touch a, a lot of broader meaning of, of sustainability. Very, thank you very much. This is really wow. And it seems like you here, I don't know if you're listening to our last video we published uh, one and a half day ago with the professor from the uh, London Business School. No, I did not. He was saying exactly this and that's how the video starts. Is saying, if you greenwash, sooner or later, someone is going to find out. It's good. It's what we see is that it's like, it's good that you try and you try to even to... Uh, because actually the question was on the mushroom side, we, we said to them, and then I will, I will make the same question to you. We asked him, we see a lot of brands that are coming up now with campaign of uh, mycelium material uh, by the end of the year or beginning of next year. However, we have never seen these materials and, and we don't really trust they will come with something nice out of it. Maybe we are wrong. Is it really uh, uh, something happening? Do you think this is 100% mycelium material? It's a stimulating question that requires a layered answer. I make a premise uh, to play devil's advocate in this case for the ones that actually play on the claims and do not have facts that counteract the claims. Uh, it's, uh, I say that it doesn't pay back in the long term, but one could also say, you know, actually it might anyway, because I am playing with the foolishness of people out there and with the short memory that seems to char characterize uh, society nowadays where the information is so much that people do not even pay, pay attention at these things. Personally, I am not like that. Uh, that people will forget by December that they will promise something like this, right? <laughs> this and this is, this is disgraceful, no doubt about it. But that was uh, Davis advocate. Uh, to come to your question more, more specifically, as an insider uh, of this field, and I say insider not only because we are uh, one of the actors in this field, uh, even if not so outspoken as the others, and until now, and now it's changing, uh, we have been deliberately silent about uh, everything that we developed, simply because our approach is driven by being concrete. We like to be pragmatic. We speak about things when we have them in our hands. When we report information or data is because it's a fact. Otherwise, we don't say that. But this is really a, 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 a company culture uh, that uh, clearly does not characterize every geographical ecosystem. Um, and in fact, it pays back, as we said earlier. Uh, when it comes to the fantastic wave of uh, announcements that took place in the past months, already end of 2020, and even more in the past few weeks, it's, it's really good and engaging and exciting to see this. And when I say I'm an insider, it's also because I am in direct contact with all such uh, uh, representatives of the companies you refer to as we are in some cases also, besides being uh, relations in, the, in, the, in business, uh, and yes, we are competitors, but we also communicate uh, to the extent possible. We are also friends in some cases with some of the founders of other companies. Uh, and so there is this type of, uh, I don't want to call it full transparency, because of course, everybody has his own assets to defend and everybody has his own confidentialities and reserved information. So we, we do not share everything, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, there is an alignment. And uh, I can tell you, as a matter of fact, that, of course, I, I don't want to homogenize all the players. They are different. Some are more honest, some are perhaps a bit less. Um, but not naming anybody here. Um, simply to say that uh, you have to read attentively in the statements that who is intelligent makes. Um, I say who is intelligent in the sense that if you read attentively through the lines, you can figure out a lot of things when one wants to be honest or at least not to lie. Uh, so that things happen to have a very specific type of formal definition. It becomes almost like in legalism, you know, legal language, where really you have to weight every single word in communication. And in fact, uh, uh, some players, yeah, go ahead. So you put a lawyer behind uh, your marketing campaign, basically. In some ways, or you're particularly keen on, on, again, the semiotics of the meaning 
of each single notion that you're throwing out there, which is, of course, very important, uh, hoping in an intelligent public to be able to read that. Uh, at the same time, um, intelligent or educated, because of course, I mean, it's also a matter of privilege. Unfortunately, still nowadays, not uh, we do not have all the same chances on a global level. Um, at the same time, yeah, you can see that uh, some players do not speak about uh, uh, materials which are 100% uh, natural, uh, that are 100% responsible. They invent new brand names, as we also do, in order just to avoid confusion with leather, which is very important because it's not leather. And at the same time, they, they start defining their material, uh, associating it with mycelium, but adding notions to it uh, in order to actually highlight that uh, there are more technologies added to it. And technologies that, because mycelium alone might not be sufficient for certain uh, requirements, let it be technical requirements, for instance, that you have when you are manufacturing uh, uh, whatever kind of uh, um, piece of garment uh, uh, ready to wear, rather than accessory, rather than shoe, rather than, rather than, or, or a piece of furniture. In that case, you actually add other technologies, uh, can be traditional textiles, it can be coatings, uh, the most responsible to the best extent possible, and so on, in order to, to actually make that incremental step towards uh, uh, changing a market that yet will require many more years of innovation journey to really achieve the ultimate goal that you are targeting. So you mean there is a mycelium on it, but yeah. not only? Yeah. Uh, what is mycelium? That's right, uh, very important. So uh, we all know mushrooms, don't we? And uh, I think many people, some people unfortunately are mycophobic and are, are afraid of, of these organisms, but uh, mushrooms are well, fungi as a kingdom uh, on their own, not plants, they are a kingdom of fungi. Uh, they are, of course, fascinating as due to their morphogenetical qualities. They grow in these crazy forms and shapes, but this is nothing else than the fruit of a much larger organism. Uh, it's like thinking about the apple being the fruit of a much larger organism, the tree. Now, in this case, the tree is not the tree, but it's the mycelium. The mycelium is the real body of the fungus. It's basically, unfortunately, something that usually gets unnoticed because it goes on underground every single where, covering the whole planetary surface everywhere. Some people uh, also uh, assume that it's the glue that is keeping uh, Earth together. Wow. Uh, and, and at the same time, and this is not an assumption, is the first internet ever invented by nature, whatever the notion of, notion of nature and uh, meaning that it's this communication channel across all living systems in the soil through which all life communicates. Without the mycelium, there is nothing. Without fungi, there is nothing. There is not us even, evolutionarily speaking. Um, and at the same time, it's this, uh, okay, so fungi have cells which are filamental cells. They are not little dots like in the case of yeast, uh, but they are like long-stranded cells, like a yarn, you could say, but very tiny. And when many yarns come together, they form this intricate network. Uh, it's a sort of a non-woven. Um, and uh, this network, this cluster of cells, uh, the cells are called IFI. So many IFI together form a cluster that we call mycelium. This is what mycelium is, the real fungus. Uh, what are the technical specifications? Is it comparable to leather? Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of, I start with the differences, um, really the origin. So what, from which processes our materials come from? Uh, first of all, the, the processes rely, yes, on biofabrication and therefore on employing a living system such as a specific fungal species and strain. But before that, they rely on the valorization of residual compounds. And this is a key aspect for me and for my work at Mogu. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's what comes before everything else. The effect of looking at what many still consider waste as something that doesn't exist. Waste is something we invented. There's no waste existing, there's resources. And uh, uh, so we look at those as residual resources that we can feed our fungi, our cultures with, in order to let fungi and the mycelium ferment such nutritious material, and I'm here talking about residues from the agro industry, from the fashion industry, the textile industry, like uh, waste cotton fiber, the dirty um, fiber full of, of plant matter, 
and things like that. And by feeding these materials to our fungi through very determined attentive processes uh, uh, of fermentation, uh, we are able to partly transform through the fungi such uh, uh, input materials. So let's say that the cellulose that is contained in this material gets transformed in other biopolymers, uh, uh, it's uh, polysaccharides, in any case it's chitin and other glucans. And by actually being able to assess the quantity and the distribution of such polymers, we can engineer the properties of the materials that derive from the fermentation process beforehand through biology. Now, this is not something you can do with a cow. Uh, and that's why I start from the differences. Of course, uh, another thing you cannot do with a cow is to grow a cow from baby to fully developed cattle in uh, two weeks. This is what we do with mycelium. With a cattle, it takes three years. Uh, cattle need a lot of space to roam. They need a lot of nutrition. They need a lot of water. They emit a lot of CO2. And well, of course, we should mention the killing, which is something that society uh, is resonating um, ever more uh, with, uh, as there's an increasing community of, of, uh, of vegan uh, um, individuals out there that uh, prefer not to consume animal products. In, in some ways, the advantages that come out of this, uh, these types of fermentation techniques, which have underlying principles that are similar, but the different players that operate in this space use their own processes, which are fundamentally different uh, in, in, in the different steps. Uh, I know, as a matter of fact, our process is very different from the one of our competitors. Um, and, uh, and yet, the objective is to be able to obtain a raw material that following a treatment, and here we make an analogy to the tanning in the leather industry, uh, but it's not tanning per se. Also the main constituent of a mycelium material such as this is chitin, eh? uh, as opposed to- Can you show uh, us in the section also? Yeah, sure. Nice. This is a thin one. We can actually come these days to four millimeters, for instance, which is of oh, course wow. quite significant and not, not that needed for some applications. Of course, it's too thick for some applications. But again, we, we can come to that, to that afterwards. Uh, but yeah, of course, the, the main constituent is different. Uh, therefore, also the processes of transformation are different. Now, once one goes through that transformation, obtains materials that uh, physically speaking, in terms of physical qualities, they do have resemblance. Uh, and it can be associated with animal-derived leather materials, though it's not leather. There's been a lot of talking about leather, simply because, first of all, there is a need of switching. And yet, I personally believe, even if I am strongly sensitive towards animal welfare, I believe that leather will never disappear. And uh, it's simply a very specific type of product. What we are here offering is not a competition per se with leather, but uh, a new typology of material, which is offering completely different opportunities that in some cases will surpass leather in terms of how you're allowed to play with it and how you're capable of, of, of engineering the material along its growth. And yet physically, it can help to have that type of resemblance. It's like in food. You can make some food innovation, but if you go for a taste that is completely against the grain and that people never experienced, it will hardly be accepted. Uh, you need to make something that uh, allows for that gradual cultural shift to and uh, just to conclude <clears throat> the the uh, of course there is the benchmarking um, when working uh, with the market players from the luxury and the high-end fashion industry uh, of course uh, leather is what is benchmarked as a, as a comparison terms when it comes to mechanical properties of the materials and technical properties and to overall physical properties. So actually really textures and, uh, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, th so there is a fundamental difference, but there are some analogies. What are the limits of it? Oh, well, the first is that it's fiddly, guys. Eh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's difficult. It's really difficult. And uh, if one wishes to venture in this direction, needs to take into account the great amount of uh, sacrifices and failures and difficulties to encounter because it's uh, th th there's no there's quite a lot of prior art when it comes to fungal fermentation and it's a, kind of, you know, a practice that dates back centuries in asian countries or in northern european scandinavian countries and so on but not for making materials 
Yet we have patents and publications from the 1950s that were already describing similar processes for creating materials such as mycelium papers. At the time, they were calling them mycelium papers, uh, even if they were more leathery. That depends really on the strain, on the ingredients, on the process, and so on. Uh, but uh, now, when if I look where we are now and I reflect on the difficulties, one main one is, of course, the different uh, scalability steps. Once you have identified uh, a suitable protocol that appears to be really consistent and therefore repeatable, uh, it's not uh, that straightforward, like with any scalable uh, step in biotechnology, to go uh, for dimensional scalability rather than for the scalability in terms of volume associated with all the automated steps needed to also make the material cost competitive. And uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, something that uh, requires a lot of attention, a lot of patience, a lot of experimentation, a lot of data, a lot of financial resources. What's the uh, environmental impact of uh, the production of the mycelium and of the mycelium also in, in its life? Now, when it comes to our processes and the final products, what we are implementing is uh, uh, LCA life cycle analysis and the related certifications that allow us to understand as much as we can. And it's really difficult sometimes to go until the point where you would like to go for understanding the real impact. Once again, we like to be very concrete. Uh, and, and this information, this data are needed for us also to understand uh, how ethical our profile really is and therefore to communicate about it accordingly. Uh, certainly, I can tell you as a matter of fact, uh, it's difficult to conduct uh, a thorough LCA because you need to look back at the origin of even of the raw material here, referring to one of the most unnoticed things often, which is the origin of the feedstock. So your nutrition, the, the food you provide to the fungus. And sometimes it's difficult to gather information about this. Not to mention that most of the organic feedstock, uh, I remind everybody, comes from monocultures. And this is another gigantic problem if we look at the agro-industry. But okay, that would be a symposium on its own. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's, uh, again, the, the, the energy costs and all the different, uh, again, if you look at the time needed for the process to thoroughly take place, it's very compact. The water used, it's really a fraction, but really a fraction of what is needed for leather. Is there some impact? Yes, there is, inevitably. We also have energy inputs uh, and they are not, uh, it's not like switching on an LED. Uh, but uh, all in all, the impact is very, very limited uh, in, in terms of, uh, again, um, negative uh, uh, carbon cycles uh, and, and, and consumption of finite resources, also because we try to rely as much as we can on energy inputs that derive from renew renewable resources in the first place. When it comes to CO2 uh, and the many deceiving uh, information that can be found these days online, it's important to notice that a lot of people talk about fungi as a kingdom as carbon negative, and this is not true. There are some fungi that indeed absorb CO2, but fungi are not plants. Fungi are uh, closer to humans than to plants. And as humans, they breathe. And when they breathe, they actually bring in oxygen, very fundamental, no oxygen, no fungi, and expel CO2. Uh, and then one could say, oh my God, this is a disaster now because we think CO2 is the most uh, dreadful word out there. And it's always been there. The point is in which amounts and in which balance are we able to take care of it? Now, it's not a disaster because fungi are, at the same time, carbon sequestrators. So again, the fact of uh, being the only uh, to, bacteria can do some things, but uh, fungi are the only decomposers in the natural world that can take up all the dead uh, plant matter and turn it back into nutrient for other life to grow. Well, this is actually a carbon negative activity that they perform. And you, if you make a, a mass balance between the CO2 that they emit and the one that they absorb, they become negative. What is the lifetime of mycelium? I mean, when I make a product out of mycelium, uh, is there a certain environment where it should live? And is there a limited time of life or can last uh, very long? Now, um, it's important to, to maybe define first one thing. When I look at a material like this or something else like this, which is also mycelium, 100% mycelium, and yet completely different and yet deriving exactly from the same strain. So it's this just to say that processes can be different. This is another sample from a different strain instead. 
And again, these are raw materials, uh, not finished materials. These are the finished ones I cannot show. Now we have to, to clarify about um, them often being defined as living materials. They are not living. They are once living. Uh, simply because in order to deliver a product to the market today, we need to deliver something that is stable. The society and human culture doesn't accept, unfortunately, anymore the transitional qualities of everything existing. So the fact that everything should flow and should be programmed for flowing. So that if we would deliver a living material that would go through different stages of transformation along its life, and that would be unpredictable to a certain extent. And that's not what the consumer wants. So our finished materials are extremely stable. They do not change and they can last for very long. Being long lasting, one of the most important requirements uh, for addressing the so-called sustainability. Things need to last and they don't need to be discarded. And that's where I'm really fighting a battle since years for changing the perspective of a uh, uh, um, different perspective of others uh, that think that because I have a material that is inherently responsible, well, I can just uh, keep fueling this fast consumption process that characterizing society. So, okay, this is responsible. Therefore I buy a garment uh, and it's, I, I wear it two or three times and tomorrow, you know, I don't like it anymore. I throw it in my garden. In any case, it gets absorbed. No, absolutely wrong. This is unacceptable for me. Any material contains so much energy. No matter if it can be reabsorbed, it must be used as long as one can. And that means that still you hold that opportunity of disregarding something when its life is terminated and there is no negative impact and it can be reabsorbed and it's a responsible process and it's cyclical and circular. Fantastic. But that doesn't justify the fast pace of production and consumption that gave uh, rise to this uh, stupid, let me say, culture of uh, disposal. This links to the fact of uh, knowing who you are. If you need to change every two months uh, clothes what you're wearing, it means that you are following some trend. If you know who is Maurizio, if you know what Maurizio likes, uh, you will wear the same thing as much as possible because it's your identity. Maurizio, can we put uh, mycelium on a Tesla car that goes to Mars next time? Absolutely. That's not just a vision, actually. It's also already not a complete fact, but uh, on the way to become. Um, now, giving you a, a very brief background, uh, uh, as a studio in this case uh, in Amsterdam, I've been, uh, I've been committed and involved in a project uh, a number of years ago. It was, if I'm not wrong, 2016. We started conducting with the European Space Agency uh, a principal feasibility study, also with the fundamental contribution of uh, Utrecht Universiteit, uh, that uh, was looking at the possibility of uh, trans minimizing the amount of uh, mass uh, that you need to transport along space travel you know weight is always a problem and logistics for space travel are a problem uh in order to be able to propagate and grow much larger amounts of bi that biomass on site how better to do it than with fungi uh, when you can just theoretically bring one spore that you cannot even see and just propagate it on site now even just a small a small little block now this is uh, uh, something that we demonstrated to be capable of resisting to extreme conditions and variations from temperature ranging on the moon between minus 100 and plus 100 to exposure to cosmic radiation and gamma rays uh, to um, growth in conditions of microgravity, microgravity and macrogravity. So these things are all uh, validated already. It's fantastic to see that nowadays NASA doing a much better communication effort is doing more or less the same project, uh, probably tackling also different angles. But the nice thing is that fungi can shield us from uh, uh, ionized radiation, cosmic radiation that would kill us almost instantly. That means that fungi can provide us with shelter on other planetary surfaces. And yet, before introducing fungi from the Earth and other planetary surfaces, we have to be very attentive and consider all the possible implications that derive from introducing any system, living or non-living, on a different alien environment, alien in the, in the sense of not known. Um, having said this, we also developed at the studio different projects uh, between reality and speculation, such as the Mars boot, that is grown along space travel by harnessing the residual liquids from the astronaut's body, as astronauts are subjected to a lot of different stresses that uh, let a lot of sweat being released in their boots. And if you take this sweat, you can partly use it for growing this type of materials um, as they function, it functions as nutrients. Again, circularity. 
and this is another another take. A few years back, uh, I make a couple of uh, uh, suggestions about anecdotes. Uh, a few years back, I was on a stage and there was uh, uh, a very, very famous French designer, very well known in the uh, product design field. Uh, uh, many people have uh, his products in their kitchens, for sure. Um, that uh, has been uh, assigned the, 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 ta the task uh, uh, of designing, actually, uh, Elon Musk uh, um, spaceship interior. And, uh, and at the time we were on the sharing the stage uh, and, and he was addressing me publicly saying, uh, we're waiting for you because we are going to make the interior of uh, the space shuttle in that way. Now, hopefully, let's see, I don't know, um, that would be nice, but it was more of a, of, a, of a funny joke or maybe it will become a consistent reality. Nevertheless, there's already fungi on the International Space Station, not because somebody brought them. We hope to be able to bring also the results of our experiments on the International Space Station for further studies. But uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, some, it, ESA, the European Space Agency, is in charge for this. This is out of my my control of course and uh, at the same time uh, there's been uh, numerous articles appeared in the media a few years back talking about the presence of uh, molds on the international space station which created massive problems also in terms of safety and this tells us uh, why all these stories to say one thing where do fungi ultimately come from they do come from out there whatever it is out there they are certainly not uh, terrestrial organisms originally they landed on earth and they contributed to change a planet. And this is demonstrated through, uh, well, demonstrated through theories, no, but is stated in evolutionary theories. This is how the planet that was a mass of nutrients in terms of minerals, so not that nutrients, uh, became a suitable ground for fungi landing on the planet that adapted and started being able, developing the skill of being able to chew the rock and derive nutrients from it through their metabolic uh, functioning, meaning turning the rock into soil. And out of this process, eventually, many steps, we are also here. So you're saying that the reason why we are here is because there was sometime some mycelium mushroom that was uh, uh, somewhere planted and then land in the herd. Absolutely. And they were looking a little different at the, back in the days. I mean, we're talking millions and millions and millions of years ago. Uh, so they were different organisms. They evolved uh, until what we know these days, but uh, at the time, uh, the original organism uh, was the one that triggered this great, uh, this great revolution that allowed also life to get out of the water. Maudizio, this was a very insightful and great conversation, very actual in our time, especially in fashion. You teach us a lot of things. It was a very pleasant discussion. Uh, I just want to ask you, if you have one uh, last thing you want to share uh, with us. Oh, well, I, I would like to thank you very much, Nicolò, and I hope that beyond this, again, the, there is so much to say and to learn about fungi. As soon as you start diving, deep diving into this kingdom, it's easy to be caught in the vortex because there's, uh, the sky is the limit when it comes to these organisms. And it's easy to get enthusiastic. For anybody out there that wants to dive there, please be focused and choose where you want to go because everything, this field of investigation that is now becoming ever more concrete requires the attention and the passion and the, the efforts of many, of many competencies, of many sensitivities, of many individuals, of many backgrounds, of many cultures. So if we really want to engage in a, in a, a truly sustainable revolution, uh, fungi are one of the main actors, perhaps not the only one, but certainly a very important one that can support that. And uh, on our side, th this is what we try, we try to do, contributing to it, and hopefully very soon we'll be able to concretely join this wave of announcements uh, with some groundbreaking news. We wish you all the best, uh, Maurizio. Thanks again, and, uh, and take care, and stay safe. Thank you so much, Nicolò. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.